Luke 12 1-56, through the Bible. Chapter 12. Theme, Jesus warns of the leaven of the Pharisees, parable of the rich fool, parable of the return from the wedding, the testing of servants in light of the coming of Christ, Jesus states he is a divider of men. Jesus warns of the leaven of the Pharisees. The twelfth chapter continues to record the tremendous ministry of our Lord. Luke adds some new things which I shall emphasize. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, Luke 12 1. This is the period of time when Christ's ministry peaked. Great crowds of people were following him. It was at this time that he performed so many miracles. There were literally thousands of blind who had their eyes opened, thousands of lame that were made to walk, and thousands of dumb that were made to speak. Christ healed multitudes. In fact, this crowd was so large it was impossible to number them. The people were pushing against one another, and actually some were being trampled. It was a dangerous place to be. Christ warns the crowd about the leaven of the Pharisees. If leaven symbolized the gospel, as many people think it does, why would the Lord warn His disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees? Leaven is a principle of evil, and the leaven of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. There is a great deal of leaven about today. For there is nothing covered, that shall not be revealed, neither hid, that shall not be known. Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness, shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell, yea, I say unto you, fear him, Luke 12 2-5. It was upon this principle that both Cromwell and I believe, Martin Luther based the statement, fear God and you will have no one else to fear. Let me repeat that when Cromwell was asked the basis for his courage and fearlessness, he replied that he had learned that if he feared God, he would fear no man. That is exactly what our Lord is saying in this passage. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God, but he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God, Luke 12 6-9. Our Lord's public rebuke of the religious leaders would, of course, bring their wrath down upon His head. And His disciples could expect the same kind of treatment from them. The Lord Jesus gives them these words of comfort and assurance of God's care for them. Since He sees the fall of a sparrow, He is fully aware of the needs of those who are teaching and preaching His word. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost it shall not be forgiven, Luke 12:10. When a man blasphemes with his mouth, that is not the thing that condemns him, it is the attitude of his heart. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to resist his convicting work in the heart and life. This is a permanent condition, unless he stops resisting. And when they bring you unto the synagogues, and unto magistrates, and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say, Luke 12 11-12. This is not intended to be an excuse for a lazy preacher or Sunday school teacher, failing to make preparation. Rather, it was assurance to his own men that the Holy Spirit, whom he would send, would give them courage and wisdom as they faithfully witnessed for him. We have many examples of this in the book of Acts. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you. Luke 12 13-14. Our Lord absolutely refused to sit in judgment in a case like this. I wish, today, those of us who attempt to counsel might take this position. Counselors are so quick to judge and tell folk what they should do. The Lord Jesus would not sit in judgment. Now, of course, when the Lord came to earth the first time, He did not come as a judge, but as a Savior. The next time He comes it will be as judge. The Father has committed all judgment unto His Son, John 5 22. Out of this incident our Lord made this statement, then gave a parable of the rich fool. And He said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness, 
for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke 12:15. This is certainly a good verse for many Christians in this age of crass materialism, when it seems that things are so important and occupy so much of our time. Covetousness is one of the outstanding sins of this hour. This is not a sin that others can see you commit, and at times you may not even be aware you are committing it. Saint Francis of Assisi once said, Men have confessed to me every known sin, except the sin of covetousness. The judgment sometimes made of Americans is quite interesting. Several years ago the Sunday Pictorial in London, gave an assessment of America in which it said, You shock us by your belief, that the almighty dollar, and armed might alone, can save the world. I am wondering if America is not in this position today, overcome by covetousness. Parable of the Rich Fool And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? Luke 12 16-17 Notice the emphasis on the word I, in this passage. This man had a bad case of perpendicular iitis, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns, and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God, Luke 12 18-21. This man had gathered all of his treasure on earth, but had stored none in heaven. The same idea is expressed in this epitaph. Here lies John Racket. In his wooden jacket. He kept neither horses nor mules. He lived like a hog. He died like a dog. And left all his money to fools. Our Lord called the man in this parable a fool but notice what kind of man he apparently was. All outward appearances indicate that he was a good man. He was a law-abiding citizen. He was a good neighbor. He was a fine family man. He was above suspicion. He was living the good life in suburbia, in the best residential area of the city. He was not a wicked man or a member of the mafia. He was not in crooked politics. He was not engaged in shady business. He was not an alcoholic or keeping a woman on the side. This man seems to be all right, yet our Lord called him a fool. Why? This man gave all of his thought to himself, and he was covetous. I had a little tea party. This afternoon at three. It was very small. Three guests in all. Just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches. While I, drank up the tea. It was also I, who ate the pie and pass the cake to me. This is the way many people live. The parable of the rich fool is one of the most pungent paragraphs in the Word of God. The philosophy of the world today is eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Our Lord said, that's the problem, that's what makes a man a fool. If you live as though this life is all there is, and you live just for self, and as though there is nothing beyond death, you are a fool. And he said unto his disciples, therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them, how much more are ye better than the fowls? Luke 12 22-24. Now, of course it is not wrong to store up things. The problem with the rich fool was covetousness. He was trying to get more, more, and more. That is the curse of godless capitalism. Have you noticed the strong judgment that is pronounced upon the rich in the last days? James 5 1 describes it, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Riches have become a curse. Our great nation thought that the almighty dollar, would solve the problems of the world, and we are in a bigger mess than ever. We are arguing about whether or not in God we trust, should remain on our money. Let's take it off, because it is hypocrisy anyway. We are not trusting in God, but in the dollar. To have a slogan on money means nothing at all. America needs to turn back to reality and truth, and quit mouthing religion. We should search our hearts, and ask ourselves, am I living for this life only? Our Lord said, go look at the birds. Learn something from them. 
If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these, Luke 12 26-27. When I go to the Hawaiian Islands, I look for the hibiscus. It is one of my favorite flowers. I wonder what God had in mind when He made the hibiscus. It is a careless flower. The rose is a careful flower that holds its petals tightly and opens them up gradually. The hibiscus, however, flings open the door and great big petals wave at you. It is a beautiful and colorful flower. Our Lord said, Consider the lilies, how they grow. Flowers are saying a lot to us today, my, you human beings certainly go to a great deal of trouble to take care of your bodies. You use lotions, sprays, ointments, and perfume, among other things upon your bodies, and then you clothe them. Even after you are all perfumed and dressed up, you cannot compare to the beauty of a flower. What a message, friend! Some of us need to depend upon God a little bit more. If then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will He clothe you, O ye of little faith? Luke 12 28. This is not to encourage indolence. Birds cannot build barns, flowers cannot spin. But man can. God intends him to use the ability He gave him, but not to live as if the exercise of these abilities, is all there is to life. And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, Luke 12 29-31. Our world is engaged in commerce. Half of the world will spend its heart's blood in building a better mouse trap, while the other half will go to the ends of the earth to buy the mouse trap. Both groups are forgetting there is a God in heaven, and that all men have an eternal soul. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Luke 12 32-34. All men will one day stand before the awful presence of God, stripped of the things that occupied his life on earth. He will have no treasure up there. He lived without God, he will die, without God. Parable of the Return from the Wedding. Now we have two parables which Christ gave in connection with his return. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not, Luke 12 35-40. Although this parable primarily applies to Israel, and the second coming of Christ, to set up his kingdom on earth, the principle applies to the church, as we anticipate his coming at the rapture. In the Orient, a groom had a wedding supper with his friends, and then went to claim his bride at her home. The servants of the groom were expected to be dressed for work, and have their lamps lighted for the return procession. The attitude of the believer to the return of Christ is to be one of readiness, having the loins, girded, doing all we can for him, and living in expectation of his return. When the figure changes from the bridegroom to the thief, it is to emphasize the element of an unexpected appearance. Paul used the same figure of speech for Christ's second coming in 1 Thessalonians 5 2 which says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. However, the Lord does not come as a thief to rapture the church. Rather, we shall arise to meet Him in the air. The testing of servants in light of the coming of Christ. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing, Luke 12 42-43. This is one of the outstanding parables that teaches our responsibility in light of our Lord's coming. Again, this parable is primarily for Israel, but the principle applies to us as believers, as we anticipate the rapture.
Many people feel that the Lord is coming soon, so they are waiting instead of working. We should work as though the Lord was not coming for another 1,000 years. Let's quit all this business of trying to set a date for His coming, and get ready. The blessed hope is the coming of Christ, and we should be filling our hope chests with works that we can one day lay at His feet. Of a truth I say unto you, that He will make Him ruler over all that He hath. But, and if, that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth His coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers, Luke 12 46 This parable teaches us two important lessons. Skepticism about the Lord's coming, again produces, 1, the mishandling of authority and, 2, laziness in one's conduct we are to live in the expectancy of His return. Our lives should be lived as if the Lord is going to appear the next moment, and we will have to give an account of ourselves to Him. In truth, we will have to account for ourselves, in that day when He comes. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more, Luke 12 47-48. Maybe he will not come today or tomorrow, but he is going to come. Our tendency is to let things slip because he has not yet appeared. We feel like we get by with things, but in reality we get by with nothing. In that day when he comes, we will be judged. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5:10. Who is we? We Christians are to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Our judgment will not determine whether or not we will be saved. This will not be a criminal court, but a circuit court where our property will be in danger. He will judge us in order to see if we are worthy or not to receive rewards. There will be degrees of rewards for the believer, just as there will be degrees of punishment for the unbeliever. Jesus states He is a divider of men. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? Luke 12 49. Even at this hour when the world is experiencing the deepest darkness we've had in 2,000 years, the Lord Jesus Christ is being blasphemed. The fire has been thrown out on the earth today. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Luke 12:50. This verse is speaking of Christ's death upon the cross. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division, for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, Luke 12 51-53. When a person receives Jesus Christ as his Savior, he is immediately separated from the unbelievers around him. This will be true whether they be his relatives or his friends. And he said also to the people, When ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, There will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? Luke 12:54-56 We need to realize and recognize what kind of world we are living in. Man thinks he is big enough and good enough to bring peace on the earth. This is a fallacy. Man is a warmonger. The United Nations was formed to bring peace and to keep peace on earth. May I say, the United Nations is one of the best fighting arenas in the world today. We need to realize that until Christ comes, there can be no real peace.